Hey guys, welcome back to a new video. Remember last year I put out this 80 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery box? Well, I decided I wanted to come up with a better idea, easier build, and even cheaper. And so that's where I came up with this design. This is a 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. This is considered a power station or a solar generator. But this has 1,280 watt hours of storage and it costs around $420. Now I'm super excited to show you guys how I built this and what you can use it for. Let's go ahead and take a look at the top of the battery box. So on the front, I have this panel that has two USB ports, a voltmeter, and a 12 volt socket. And I love how these have dust covers. And then I have four Anderson power pole connections. Now each of these support 20 amps. So I can pull a total of 80 amps out of this battery if I needed to run an inverter or another heavy DC load. Now I have this flush mount push button LED switch. I love how it has this LED light whenever it's turned on. And then there's a handle that folds away flat so you can set something on top of this. But when you wanna use it, you just pull it up and carry it around. Now this thing comes in at 31 pounds, so it's pretty heavy. Now looking inside the case, let me just show you a little bit how this works. Now I have four individual 100 amp hour cells that are wired together in series to make a 4S lithium iron phosphate battery. Now on top of that, I have a half inch sheet of plywood. It's about six and a half inches wide and about 10 inches long. And I mounted the fuse block and the BMS to that so they don't move around. Now this BMS supports 120 amps. It has low temp cutoff and a Bluetooth module so you can actually set up the battery and look at all the specs using your smartphone. Now all these black and red wires just go to the connections I already showed previously. The Anderson power pole, the 12 volt and the USB connections. They're all 12 gauge and they're all fused for safety. Now I also set up another BMS, so if you guys wanna use a cheaper BMS, I built that and I'll show you how that works later on in the video. So stay tuned if you wanna see that full guide of how this is built. Now right now, let's go ahead and just show you how I plan to use this and what it can power. Okay, so these are some of the things that you can run off this battery during camping trip or during a power outage. Now this is not everything, but this is just a good idea. Now the first thing that I plan to run off this battery is a 12 volt compressor fridge. I love to use these while camping. They don't require any ice and they're super efficient. This is my ice code JP30. I bought this earlier this year. Haven't done a video on it yet, but I do plan to do a future video with all my ice code 12 volt compressor fridges and we'll do a comparison for that. But this pulls around 15 watts at 70 degrees. So if I wanted to run this for 60 plus hours off this battery without charging, that's a great way to do it. Now the next thing I plan to use is this 12 volt fan. Now a lot of people like to have fans to make white noise when they sleep or if they wanna have airflow in the tent or in their camper, this is an amazing fan. Now this runs off 12 volts. It also has a section for batteries at the bottom. But what's really cool is on this side you have a 5521 barrel plug. So if you have a, uh, an adapter like this that does 5521 to 12 volt, you can run this off your battery and you can get like a hundred hour runtime on this because it only pulls like eight watts. Now, another thing that's awesome to use off a battery like this is another battery charger. Now, this is the Mi Boxer C4. This charges double A's, triple A's, lithium ion 18650s, or even lithium iron phosphate batteries. And this accepts AC input or DC input. So I can run this with this same cable 5521 off this battery. So it's super cool to have this to either charge up batteries for lanterns or uh, headlamps that you have laying around. Now the next thing is this XTAR EU4S USB charger. Now this takes a DC input, so like 24 to 12 volts. So solar panels or even a battery like this. It has this uh, 12 volt to eight millimeter plug that comes with it or a solar panel that plugs in eight millimeter. Now what's nice is this does not have USB type C power delivery, but this will do USB C power delivery 45 watts. So I could charge a laptop or a tablet that supported power delivery. I will do a future review video on this because this is an awesome charger along with my XTAR SP100 solar panel. Now I always like to bring my scale rock crawler uh, with me on my trips. It's a fun little toy to have to mess around and gotta have a hobby grade charger so I can charge up those batteries. And this Turnigy charger uh, is powered off 12 volts so it's awesome to be able to use this battery. And the last thing that's really cool to have is a AC inverter. Now this is a 300 watt pure sine wave inverter. It's the best tech inverter. I don't really have many AC appliances that I would use, maybe charging a laptop or running an LED projector uh, for like a little movie night. That's what I'd probably use on this. But if you wanted to have a larger inverter, just remember that this supports, if you use all four Anderson outputs in parallels, it supports 80 amps. So you could get 
Uh, 13 volts at 80 amps is about 1,000 watts. So you can have a 1,000 watt inverter running off this with this current setup. But if you upgraded the wiring to handle 100 amps, which is the limit for these cells, they're rated at 100 amp discharge, then you could get a 1,300 watt output using a 1,500 watt inverter. You just wouldn't want to push it to the end. That's just a basic idea of what you could power with this. And it's just really useful for emergencies and for camping. Okay, it's time to do a capacity test on the battery. So this is rated at 100 amp hours or 1,280 watt hours. So we wanna discharge it at a 0.2C discharge rate. So 1,280, 20% is a 256 watt load. I'll show you my setup here. I have these large wires coming out of the battery. And then I have this shunt here on the main negative line. And with this shunt, you have this meter. So you can set the amp hour capacity of the battery. I have it set to 110 amp hours just to be safe. And so as power goes through these wires, this will subtract the capacity all the way down until the battery dies. Now, these wires head to this inverter, and then we're gonna have a 256 watt load here. So let's go ahead and start the test and we can watch these results closely. Okay guys, the BMS just shut off. So I uh, turned it back on and we got 4.85 amp hours left out of 110. So that gives us 105 amp hours we pulled from the battery. So that is over capacity, that's awesome. Remember this is rated at 100 amp hours and we got 105. Okay, let's go ahead and test the low temperature cutoff. So I have a cup of ice water here. See it's charging at 2.3 amps. Let's go ahead and put the temperature sensor into the ice water. And there it goes, it shut off. So the low temperature cutoff does work. Okay, the battery's completely full, it's 14.6 volts. Let's see if I can overcharge it and if the battery will shut off. And there it goes, okay. So it did shut off. It's, this is a false reading here because the BMS is shut and this is charging the, you know, the, the circuit outside of that. So it does have over voltage protection. Okay, let's go ahead and briefly talk about charging up this battery. Now, I use the Anderson power pole connections at the top and any power going into this battery is charging it. Any, ba any power going out of it is discharging it. There's no specific charging port or discharging port. Basically, it's just like a car battery. You put power in, it charges it, and taking power out discharges it. Now, there's a couple different ways to charge it up. You can charge it on AC power. You can charge it with a DC charger, or you can charge it with solar panels using a solar charge controller. Now, this is called a adjustable power supply. This is a constant current, constant voltage, and that's how lithium iron phosphate batteries charges through a constant current, constant voltage charging pattern. So you can set this to 14.6 volts is the total power that you put into this, and then you can set this to 10 amps. So this is a 10 amp charger, and as it gets up to 14.6 volts, the amperage drops all the way to zero, and then your battery's fully charged. These are fairly inexpensive, but they only charge at 10 amps, so it's not very fast. So there's better ways to charge it a little bit quicker. Now I have a video on this charger here. This is my Abso Kisei DMT 12 volt 50 amp charger. So this is a dual charger. It does DC to DC charging. So if you are driving down the road and your car alternator is putting out DC power, you can hook to your car battery and charge up to 50 amps while driving down the road, or you can just start your car and charge at 50 amps. So you can charge this battery super quick uh, with this charger. The other thing you can do with this is it has solar input. So it will accept 35 amps of solar input. Now it accepts 50 volts to 14.5 volts. So it'll accept two solar panels, two 12 volt solar panels in series, or it'll accept just regular parallel. Now this works really well because it's two chargers in one. And if you wanna learn more about this, just check out my video. I'll include that uh, link in the video description, but this is a really decent charger and the price is right because you're getting two chargers in one. Now I like to charge at a high level, but I don't really have a high powered AC charger. So I came up with this option. So basically I have this AC to DC power supply. So I plug this into my wall. It puts out 24 volts at 15 amps and I can plug that into the solar input and I can charge at 15 amps instead of just 10 amps here. Now I do have plans to get a bigger charger in the future that can do up to 60 amps, but it's pretty expensive. But as I have all these batteries around, I think having a high power charger is definitely gonna help. 
Now just remember, this has a 50 amp charging limit, so you wouldn't wanna push it past that. That's just the capability of the cells inside. Okay, so we basically talked about all the functionality of this battery, the charging, and how I plan to use it. And uh, now we just have a few other things to talk about before we jump into the build section of the video. Now, one thing is the cost. Now, I mentioned this was about $420. Well, if you already have some of the components laying around the house, wiring, ring terminals, things like that, then this is actually going to be a little bit cheaper. It only cost me about $325 to build this because I had so many of the components already laying around. Now, it could be the same for you. And the price does change as you change BMSs. Now, most of the build video was done with this BMS. This is super nice because uh, it's cheap and it does everything automatically. There's no interface or anything. You can't see what's going on, but it does handle it really well. It has the low temp cutoff. I tested that and it just, does what it's supposed to do. Now, if you want more of an interface where you can see what's happening, you can see each individual cell voltage, things like that, then you might wanna to upgrade to the Bluetooth BMS, which has the Bluetooth module where you can see it with the smartphone app. Now, that's just my opinion. Maybe you wanna come up with something different, but both of these options are great options. Just depends what you wanna do. Now, if you guys have any questions about this build process, go ahead and throw a comment down below. Any questions about the battery charging it, anything like that. The other thing is I'm gonna have a link down to my website where I have all this information about building this so you guys can build one yourselves or at least replicate some of the process so it's a little bit easier to do. Now let's go ahead and jump into the build section of the video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Give me a thumbs up if you liked the content and we'll see you in the next video. Okay guys, the first step before assembling this into a 4S lithium iron phosphate battery is to get the cells all at the same state of charge. Now the best way to do that is to hook them in parallel and top balance them. Now you want to take note of what each of these voltages are before you connect them together. From the supplier, they should come around 3.2 volts. I had some that were 3.2, 3.21, and 3.22, so they're pretty close there, shouldn't, shouldn't be a problem. But if you had one that was like 3.6 and then one that was 3.1 you would not want to hook those together you want to charge those individually and then you can connect them together so we have them in parallel here i use this 5 16 threaded rod because the ring terminals are actually 5 16 and i just put two nuts on each side so i have all the negatives connected here in parallel and i did the same thing on the positive side so i have all the positives parallel together and the nuts holding that on so what we're doing here is we're getting them all charged up together so they're balanced. Now this will help us in the long run because then we won't have a cell that gets out of balance as long as all these cells are healthy. Now I have my adjustable power supply so I'm charging the positive side here, the negative side here, and I have this set to 3.65 volts which is the top uh, amount of charging limit you want on these and we're going to charge it at 3 amps just over a long period of time to get these all equal. Now you just wanna be very careful when you're doing this. Do not let the negative side touch the positive side. So you can see there's pretty good distance there. And you just wanna make sure no kids or anything are gonna be playing with this. Uh, you know, keep this away from anybody that's gonna mess with it. Okay, so it's been about four days. Remember when this is in parallel, it's about 400 amp hours of storage. So it's gonna take a while to trickle charge this up. Now I have my voltmeter connected. We're sitting at 3.65, so these are all charged together in their top balance. So we should be good to take it all apart and then start assembling our battery pack. Okay, so this is how I'm going to mount the BMS in the battery. So I have my BMS and my fuse block mounted to this half inch plywood. Now it's cut at six and a half inches wide and 10 and a half inches long. Now I took these number six by half inch screws and I basically screwed in the fuse block on all four corners where I wanted it and it's secure. And then I took out three of these screws on the BMS. Now these screws are M3 by 0.5 and I bought 20 millimeter ones. Then I marked where I wanted the holes. There's three that I drilled out. And then after being drilled out, I could screw in the BMS at three places and now this is super secure. So now I just need a way to connect the bus bar negative to the negative of the BMS. The main positive of the battery is going to be here. So this is the main negative of the battery. So I have to connect this here and I have to connect the negative battery terminal here. Now I've seen people come up with making their own bus bars and that's what I decided to do. This is half inch outer diameter copper pipe. I hammered it flat, cut it to length and then drilled two holes in it. And then I put some heat shrink on it just to mark it as negative. And now this fits perfectly here. 
Now this one did have to be bent slightly and uh, it's really easy to bend it. So I'm gonna put this here to connect uh, the fuse negative to the BMS negative. And then I'm going to connect this side to the negative terminal of the battery. So I think we're set up here. Everything on this should be easy and straightforward from here out. Okay, so I have the bus bars in place on both that side and this side. Then you have this plastic nut that you can put on here to protect uh, the negative side of the battery. I'm probably gonna end up wrapping each of these and covering these with some sort of protective tape, but uh, there we go. Okay, so I have the cells in the case. Now these are set up in series. So you have negative, positive, negative, positive. Okay, so this is how the board fits in here. Now you have your main negative here and your main positive up here. Now all the power is gonna be coming out of this fuse block. So our main positive connects to this here and our main negative will connect to the BMS here. Power goes through the BMS and then up to the fuse block. Now these are in series configuration. So we'll tie these two together, tie these two together and tie those two together. And we have our low temperature cutoff here. And then we just have to hook up our balance leads that plug into here and then at each point. Okay, so this is the balance lead that goes to the BMS to each of the cells. Now the purpose of this is this tells the BMS what the voltage is between each of the cells and then it knows when to shut off or turn on each cell connection. So what we need to do is take each of these 5 16th ring terminals and solder them to each of these wires. Now we're connecting our battery together with these 5 16th bolts and they're going to go on like this and then the nut's going to go on. So this is how we will measure each of the cells for the battery. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so I finished soldering these up. Now they're ready to hook up to the battery. Now I wanna worry about uh, our connections to the outside of the battery case, like our 12 volt, our Anderson, things like that. Let's go ahead and worry about those connections. Okay, so let's go ahead and drill the holes for the voltmeter, 12 volt socket, and USB ports, and then also the two holes for these Anderson power pole connections. So I'm using a inch and a quarter hole saw. I've centered it exactly where I want it, and I marked a Sharpie dot on each center location. It's gonna get messy in here. Let's go ahead and drill these out and then we'll clean it up. Okay, so I have them drilled out and installed. So that came out nicely. Okay, so that turned out pretty nice. We have all the connections up front and then I have my two Anderson power pole connections. And I just recommend doing that when the case is empty so you just don't get everything super dirty. So pretty awesome. Okay guys, I'm super excited. You saw me drill out those holes and now I've installed all of these and plugged some wires in. So most of these wires, now it looks like a ton of wires, but most of these wires are for these Anderson power pole connectors. There's eight wires total. This is super flexible 12 gauge silicone wire. Uh, I'll have all the parts I use in the video description. So I have the positive and negatives just running right back to the fuse block. And then for the front panel here, it's super easy. I have a 12 volt socket, I have a voltmeter, and I have a USB port. Now all you do is you take the positive from each one and you tie them together and run it to the back. And you do the same thing with the negative. You take the negative, 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 tie them together and run it to the back. Now the only thing I have left to do with this is I want to uh, put an inline switch for this front panel. So I marked the 12 gauge wire that I used for these three connections. I'm planning to put a switch here in line so that I can disable these front panels when I'm not using it. Pretty excited guys, we're moving forward with the build. Now we just have to hook these wires up to the fuse block. 
Okay, just want to provide an update to show you some progress that I made on the wiring. Now this is just super tedious and it'd be boring to watch, but I'll show you what I ended up doing. Now I have all my positives hooked to this side of the fuse block, and then I have my negatives routed onto this side. So remember, this is the negative terminal, the main negative, and this is the main positive. And they're all uh, crimped and soldered, and then I put heat shrink on the positive side as well. Now I wanted this to look really good, so I cut each of these to length at the exact length that they needed to be, and I really liked the way it turned out. I did the same thing on this side. Now the only thing that's changed on this side was me putting in this switch. So this is a push down switch with an LED light. Now what you have to do is you have to wire um, the blue side up to power and then the opposite side you have to hook the LED and continuing power and then you have to ground it. So I grounded it with all the other grounds here and that runs all the way back. And then I just jumped in that one wire that I marked with the Sharpie, cut it in half and then I basically uh, soldered both these ends in. Once I hook it up, we should be able to test if this switch works. Here's a closer look at the switch. Now, all I had to do was drill a 7 8 inch hole with a spade bit, and then uh, it just went right in, and then it has a nut on the back that screws in to hold it tight. So you can see it has a really nice push down, and it should light up blue once it's connected. Okay, so now it's time to connect all the cells together in series and to connect the BMS uh, loom. So now if you look here, this is the negative and then it just goes to the next cell, the next cell, the next cell, main positive. So I will be connecting all these connections together with these 516 bolts and these nylon uh, lock nuts. And it's nice to have these 516 rings so they'll just go right on here. So then I can easily swap this BMS out in the future if I want. And I did that on purpose because I have a whole nother BMS with a Bluetooth module that I'm going to uh, put in here as a second demo so you guys can compare which one you like more. Okay, so that's the part you want to be the most careful about. Remember, this is main ground, so each of these, if they touch it, it gets short out. Now, I do have plans to cover these up. I'm just gonna do some voltmeter testing to see if they uh, equal the right amount of voltages and then I'll go ahead and plug the BMS in. Okay, so I plugged the BMS in and nothing happened. And then I remember, I think I saw in a Will Prowse video that you have to en enable this by charging it. So what I did is I just um, plugged in my battery charger into one of these Anderson power pole connectors and just turned it right on and it worked just fine. So uh, pretty awesome. I think we're good here. Uh, now we can turn on uh, the battery. We got this nice green LED, and uh, we have voltmeter, USB ports, and 12 volt socket. So I thought it'd be helpful to show you guys how you could set up a BMS on here that has Bluetooth capability. So you'll use the same fuse block, and you'll see use the same dimension of plywood. This is half inch plywood, but it's a little different on how it connects. Instead of using bus bars, you're going to use the included 10 gauge wires. And I have these going into a quarter inch ring terminal here that supports six to eight gauge wire. And I have it crimped and soldered. And then uh, this is just connected to the main negative. Now on the other side, we have uh, the same 10 gauge wires. You'll see this side is for charging and this side is for the battery. And this is a 5 16 ring terminal that is also uh, crimped and soldered. And then we have our connections at the bottom of the BMS. 
Now this is connected through two points on the piece of plywood and it's pre-drilled. These are M3 by 0.5 by 30 millimeters because this is a little bit longer. Now with the Bluetooth BMS, you get two temperature sensors. You get the Bluetooth module and then you get the same BMS with uh, bare wires and I put these 516s ring terminals on it. So very similar setup. It's gonna connect the same exact way as demonstrated earlier in the video. It just has the addition of a Bluetooth module and it has an additional uh, temperature sensor. Now this is the Bluetooth app that you can get while using this BMS and you can connect and see individual cell voltages. You can see all the capacity and uh, you can actually track the uh, capacity over time gives you the temperature of the cells. It's just a really cool app. And I think it's totally worth it if you upgrade the BMS so you can have the Bluetooth module. Okay, so we got the BMS board installed. I just reconnected all these wires, put in new fuses. Now remember we have our main positive here, main negative here, nothing really changed with that. Now I wanna insulate each of these uh, connections here so we don't get any short circuits. So let me go ahead and insulate those up. And uh, basically the same installation as before, we have the BMS cable and each of the leads go to each of these points on the battery. And then we have our Bluetooth module sitting down here. It's perfect, it's out of the way. And we have two temperature sensors. Mm -hmm. 